Hi. So I would like to talk about the expression problem today. So this is an interesting software extensibility challenge. Um, it's interesting for us here in this sort of context because it actually helps us, you know, studying uh, some subtle differences between object-oriented programming and functional programming. And in fact, uh, you know, it will allow me to, you know, not today, but perhaps in the next presentation, to bring up some new supernatural powers of Haskell, because it's it's a real challenge. I mean, it's a real coding challenge, and it turns out uh, this challenge can be addressed with some designated uh, Haskell expressiveness. Okay, but let me let me exp you know explain the problem first. Um, so I'm going to use a little uh, Haskell session here uh, for illustration. So you know we are we are at the Haskell prompt of our Haskell system, and we are entering some expressions. In fact, we're playing with an expression language, as you see. So you know we have some we have constant expressions here. We have addition expressions. So we can build arithmetic expressions. So we we use like you know. Uh, constructors of an algebraic data type. So you have, uh, I guess you know about algebraic data types in Haskell. So yeah, so we construct terms and those terms denote uh, arithmetic expressions. We can, as you see, we can pretty print those expressions like in normal uh, concrete syntax. And we can also evaluate those expressions. So, you know, no big deal. So the question now that leads to the expression problem is, you know, how can we program such a interpreter and such a pretty printer? I mean, how can we implement such an expression language so that later on we can easily add more expression forms, such as subtraction or negation. And we can also add more operations such as, you know, optimization and, uh, well, cogeneration. So how can we set up, you know, our programming style so that such extensions are possible? Okay, that's the expression problem. Yeah, so here's a sort of a summary um, of the expression problem. You know, we think of programs as, uh, you know, the union of some data and some operations. I mean, this is, of course, a simplification for the purposes of this extensibility discussion here. And then the idea is, of course, that uh, we assume that there might be many data variants, right? Uh, so in our running example of an expression language, the data variants are those expression forms, right? So there might be constant expressions, there might be addition expressions, and there might be many other data variants. Now, uh, there might be also many operations. So we might start with some operations, like here we started with pretty printing and evaluation. And, you know, the idea is that there might be other operations eventually. So the expression problem is whether or not, and if so, how we can add data variants and operations. Okay, this sounds like a simple problem, but as you will see, uh, it's not so easy to, uh, you know, uh, address this problem in a satisfactory manner in functional and in all programming, at least not as long as we are limiting ourselves to, you know, basic functional and basic OO programming. Okay. So indeed, so what I will do is I will study this expression problem, you know, with these two paradigms, but, uh, you know, I should make sure that we have some shared understanding of what I mean by extensibility, uh, you know, being extensible in the data variant dimension or in the operation dimension. Well, I mean by that, that we at least should uh, take care of three requirements. The first requirement is, you know, that we should allow for, you know, code level modularization in the sense that if we have a given program and we want to extend it, then this extension should be in a new code unit. We should not allow ourselves to extend the program by going back into existing code units 
and you know editing them. So you know this is what by, what we mean by extensibility that we do not touch existing code. Okay. The second requirement is called separate compilation. So we want our uh, basic program and our extensions to be all uh, you know true modules in the sense of compilation and deployment. So suppose we have a program, we compile it and we ship it. So you know it's running at the customer's uh, site. Now the customer requests an extension to the program, then we should be able to you know uh, develop this extension by means of a, another module which we can you know compile in separation so we don't have to recompile anything that was there before and so we you know we can deliver the extension to the customer just by you know shipping that new module for the extension okay that that's another requirement and then the third requirement is static type safety so I mean, uh, suppose we're using a, a language like uh, C Sharp or Java with some means of uh, sophisticated means of type checking, you know, uh, to help us with uh, avoiding certain kinds of programming errors, then we want to preserve that type checking power uh, even in the view of, uh, of extensibility. So, you know, just because our program is becoming extensible or is supposed to be extensible we don't want to compromise on static type safety okay so these are the three requirements that we set up for extensibility and now we will actually try to you know play with the expression problem like we know we start from some expression forms and we want to add more expression forms or more operations on expression forms okay so let's see how this works in Haskell, you know, like the basic programming style that I guess everyone would apply, you know, at least after this book, I guess, um, is, you know, you would first set up your algebraic data types for your data. So in the, in the case of the running example, we have, uh, you know, we need an algebraic data type expert for expression forms. And there are, there should be like two constructor declarations because we want to start from two data variants, you know, constant expressions and addition expressions. So the constant expression form uh, has a constructor component for the integer, you know, for the value of the constant. And the addition form of expression has two sub-expressions for the two operands of addition. Okay, so this would be a perfect module in Haskell, you know, we could compile it, uh, you know, we can, th the type checking can apply to this module, and that's great, right? So, you know, we're done with those data variants for now. It's one module. And now we can go and, you know, develop other modules on top of data. Um, so we have another module, module pretty printer, and we import the data module. So now we can actually implement operations for our expression forms, right? And so this is just basic uh, style of functional programming. Say we uh, define recursive function here, pretty print. Uh, we can look at the type and then we see, okay, this pretty print function takes an expression and maps it to a string, okay? And then other than that, uh, the pretty print function is defined by case discrimination or by pattern matching over the structure of expressions, right? So we have one equation per expression form. So for example, to pretty print a constant expression, we just turn the uh, integer component of the const constant term into a string with shell, right? And then the equation for addition, you know, it, it takes apart the addition and it recurses, uh, it recurses into the left uh, operand of addition as well as into the right operand of addition. And so we get back strings from those recursive applications. We concatenate these strings, but we put, of course, the infix plus in between. Okay, so this is, you know, just very straightforward functional programming on a recursive data structure or, you know, on a recursive algebraic data type. And, uh, you know, it just is meant to uh, make the point that operation extensions 
are very straightforward in function programming. You know, you can always go and define yet another function on existing data types and uh, existing functions as well. So, you know, just to make the point, here's the other uh, function that we used in a demo. So this is the evaluate function, which takes an expression and returns an int. And again, we perform, uh, you know, pattern matching, case discrimination on the expression forms. And we use recursion in those places where the data structure is recursive too, right? So you see, so we can define uh, one module per operation, everything is great. So, you know, we have basically this uh, chain of extensions, if you like. You know, we start from the data module, then on top of it, we define a pretty printer module, you know, a function that implements a pretty print operation. And then yet on top of this, uh, well, we, we uh, also supply the evaluate function in a designated module. So the, the situation, however, that we have with basic functional programming is that it is easy to carry out operation extensions. So as we just have demonstrated, because it's easy to perform new functions on existing data. It is, however, not easy to perform data extensions. So why is that? And what do I mean by data extension? Well, I mean by data extension, I mean, of course, that we could add another data variant, another expression form, and without touching existing code. And we can also make sure that all the existing operations, like in our example, let's say pretty printing, works for this new expression form. So why is this not easy or perhaps not even possible in basic function programming? Well, this is because algebraic data types are closed and in fact also recursive function definitions defined by, you know, pattern matching are closed too in basic functional programming. And because they are closed, there's no way to kind of, you know, in a, in a module that, that, that is layered on top of, you know, the basic data variants, to, to actually, you know, add a data variant. There's just no way to do this. Okay, so again, we could of course go back to the data module and patch it, but you know, this is not extensibility. So we, because we would touch existing code units. Okay, so this is interesting. So with functional programming, we only get operation extensions easily, but we don't get data extensions easily. So this is just, you know, this is the take home message, you know, uh, it's easy to add operations with functional programming. It's not so easy to add data variants. Okay. Now let's try the same experiment uh, with C sharp. So in C sharp, you know, you might think we we could add uh, we could start from those classes here. So those classes would more or less resemble the algebraic data type of our Haskell development, and uh, so we would have you know an abstract class expert in place of the algebraic data type expert. We would have concrete subclasses constant add in place of the constructor declarations constant add in our Haskell development. Okay. And then, you know, those fields here, they correspond to the constructor components of our algebraic data type. So this is like more or less the, the C sharp rendering of our uh, data variants, right? So there's nothing special here. Uh, there are no methods in those classes, which means, you know, this is just about data structure. So at this point, we haven't covered any operations whatsoever. We don't have pretty printing, we don't have evaluation. So how would you, you know, deliver operations in basic or all programming? Well, you would add methods to the class. So let's do this. So let's say you know, this is our initial program. So this is now the same classes, expert, const, and add, but now there is a virtual method, uh, pretty print, right? Uh, which is declared abstractly here. And then, you know, it's, it's implemented for the concrete expression forms, const, and add. So, you know, we might think that this is a good initial program. You know, we compile it, we ship it, the customer, uh, you know, uses it. And now the customer says, hey, this is a great program, but um, I would like to have an evaluator for this program. 
And then we say, okay, no problem. We, we just have to add, you know, the evaluate method to those clauses. Well, but that's, that's where, you know, we are in trouble because, you know, um, how do we do this? I mean, uh, so we have to violate separate compilation then, right? But that means, you know, in order to supply an extension here for evaluation, we would need to touch this code and add another method to it. We would need to recompile this code and, you know, ship those classes again to the customer and he would need to throw away those existing, uh, you know, um, classes and install a new version. So this is bad extensibility. Um, okay, so, but remember, this was easy with Haskell, right? We could easily add pretty printing and then subsequently evaluation. So with OO programming, we, we obviously, we failed to, you know, do operation extensions, even though they were easy with Haskell. Okay, but we can do something with OO programming here, which we couldn't do with uh, function programming. Say we um, can do data extensions easily. So we can, of course, always go and add another class. You know, in this case, we add a class neck for negation, uh, unary negation with, uh, you know, one operand, the expression for which negation is to be computed. And, you know, and we add a subclass to the initial system, uh, which already has a few expression forms and which also has snapshotted the pretty print operation in those classes. So because, you know, expert has a pretty print operation, uh, you know, our subclass NAC also has a pretty print operation, no surprise. So, you know, this is a data extension. It's more than just the data structure. It also defines the case for all pre-existing operations. In our case, we only have one operation, pretty print. So this is interesting, right? So, you know, we can perform data extensions as, as you just have seen. So suppose we had this initial program, you know, with some data variants and say some operations, in this case, pretty printing, we can go and add one data extension, perhaps another data extension and so on. So this is interesting also because it means the situation is pretty much inverse compared to function programming. So we can do data extension. So we can go from a program that, you know, uh, cover some expression forms to program with more expression forms. We can do that. We couldn't do that with Haskell. However, we can't do operation extension because we are not supposed to, you know, we cannot add uh, methods to existing classes, you know, without violating separate compilation. So, you know, it, it seems like functional programming or programming are complementary here, which is interesting. Okay, so this is the summary. It's easy to add data variants in basic O programming. It's not so easy to add operations without touching existing code. There are two subtle things uh, worth pointing out with this formulation here. So, you know, you should realize that I quite often say basic O programming and also somewhere else basic function programming. And uh, you should also say, see, realize that I say easy. So these are two terms with some, you know, extra semantics here. So by basic old programming, I mean like, you know, sort of by the basic rules, you know, what you learn in a 101 or O course, right? So, so what I'm saying is, you know, if you, if you go nuts and use, you know, every weapon available, you can also get data extensibility, uh, sorry, and operation extensibility both in OO programming. And then when I say it's not so easy to add operations, so this is the this is part of the same story here, right? I mean, in, in, if you're willing to engage into, you know, sophisticated encodings, well, then you can get both dimensions of extensibility. And so, but the point is, you know, we don't want to do crazy things. We want to use relatively uh, straightforward uh, idioms and design patterns, and still we would like to get both dimensions of extensibility. Okay, well, so, you know, let's look again at these three requirements and let's try to do some not too crazy things with C-sharp. In a sense, let's try to, 
you know, put some stress on uh, C sharp. So let's use some, you know, design patterns. Let's use some uh, advanced language constructs and let's see whether we can solve the expression problem. So, you know, so far with basic C sharp, we can get uh, data extensibility, but we don't get um, operation extensibility. So let's try to, you know, you know, meet these three requirements, you know, with some more sophistication. So I think these four options come to mind, you know, I mean, if you, if you think of other options, and I mean, I, I would really like to exclude very crazy stuff, of course, this is uh, subject to, um, you know, discussion, but I think these four are relatively, you know, reasonable. So, you know, you might say, hmm, can I perhaps solve the expression problem by means of the wizarder pattern? Or you could say, huh, I know this partial classes construct of C-sharp. I guess I can solve the expression problem with that. And then you say, well, I mean, okay, I can use, uh, you know, type cast, type test, and probably also, you know, code up uh, operation extensions that I couldn't code up with basic C-sharp, okay? Or you might say, I know this C sharp three construct for extension methods, which is specifically meant to add methods to pre-existing classes. That one should definitely solve the expression problem. So, and I think this is this is like the four options that that typically people uh, might think of, and I call them non-solutions because they always fail at least with regard to one of these requirements. Okay, and so let's discuss them. I mean, you know, it's not so much about function programming here, but it's interesting to understand where these non-solutions indeed fail because, you know, it helps us preparing for some really clever approach of functional programming, okay? So, um, basically the short story is if you try the visitor design pattern, and I hope you know that the visitor design pattern, uh, let me see, do I have the book somewhere? Uh, oh yeah, here it is. Um, you know, I hope you know the visitor design pattern. Um, well, that one gives us uh, sort of the same kind of extensibility as in basic Haskell. So this is funny, you know, it, it, you, so we do get operation extensibility, as I will show you, but you lose data extensibility, which you had before in C-sharp. So now with... Uh, with uh, partial classes, the story is pretty simple. You know, partial classes allow you to scatter the members of a class over uh, multiple code units. Ah, that sounds perfect. But the problem is it's a sort of a pre-processing uh, compile time uh, facility. So it doesn't really solve our problem. I mean, it would violate a separate, separate compilation requirement that we have. Now then, okay, you can already imagine if you if you try to use, you know, type cost, type test to implement operations, uh, well, you know, this is probably not going to be very statically type safe, and that's another requirement we set up. And then extension methods, I don't know how many of you know extension methods. Well, I guess the C sharp uh, nerds, of course, know it. Uh, you know, uh, it allows you to add methods to existing classes, but these are not truly virtual methods and you need virtual methods uh, in general. I mean, you know, go back to our earlier c -sharp code and th those methods had to be virtual and extension methods are too limited in that respect. So let me quickly run through these four options and, you know, let's see where they really fail, okay? So we start with the visitor pattern. If you apply the visitor pattern to our running example, then we should set up this interface here for visitors, for the expression language. And actually, we parameterize it in the result type of the operation, because, you know, you might want to compute strings or integers or what, what other things. And so there are as many wizard methods here in this interface as there are data variants. So in a way, you see immediately where the whole design pattern is going to fail you know, with regard to the expression problem. Namely, we take a snapshot here of the data variants we want to support and we freeze them in this interface. So no data extensibility, right? So we had data extensibility previously in all programming, but now that, you know, this interface takes a dependency on the data variants, we will not have 
proper data extensibility. Okay, but just to make sure that, that you understand how this all uh, works. Okay, so here's how you would implement an operation with the visitor design pattern. Operations would be classes that implement the visitor interface. For example, the pretty printer would instantiate the result type of the visitor interface to string. And then we would have like two concrete implementations for the two visit methods. And you can think of these visit methods a little bit like the equations of recursive function definitions in Haskell. So that's interesting. So, you know, uh, you can now really see very well that a visitor is sort of a piece of functional programming, okay? Um, so it basically says, you know, when we hit a const, we do this, and when we hit an add, we do that. And so you see that in those places where we would apply some function recursively, um, we use this accept, accept function that's part of the visitor design pattern, okay? Um, so, you know, you can think of accept as, uh, as function application. It basically says, you know, you know, given this function, you know, this visitor, apply it to that expression. So it's a little bit flipped, right? But, you know, it is essentially function application. So, and so the idea is that, you know, the function definition is in the visit method implementations and the mechanics of function application is in the, you know, accept method. That's defined once and for all according to the scheme of the visitor method. So this is interesting, right? So we understand how the visitor design pattern is basically functional program. Okay. Um, so we can define any number of classes that implement the visitor interface. So here is also the evaluator class, you know, that instantiates the result type of the visitor to int, because we, uh, with an evaluator, we compute an int. And, you know, it's, it's exactly the same style, again, two visit methods. And again, we use accept uh, for the recursive function application, so nothing special. And then, you know, here's how we have to set up our data variants with the visitor. And, you know, this is really a boilerplate code because, you know, after all, it's not a truly functional programming language in terms of pattern matching. And so, therefore, this is what we do with the except method here that we essentially, you know, teach those classes to, um, you know, support pattern matching, right? So this is one way to think of the double dispatch protocol of the visitor that you get that way. Okay, but you know, the point is, uh, this pattern fails, you know, in terms of extensibility, because, I mean, you see, like how we take dependency on the visitor interface here and here and here and you remember that the visitor interface took a snapshot of the data variance so we are really you know with this with these classes here we, we really committed to a particular set of data variants so we lost data extensibility so too bad so this is really sort of the same extensibility situation as with haskell in a sense okay but there's a riddle for you, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, so please try to find out whether perhaps the situation isn't as bad as I just said. So, you know, can you argue that perhaps there is some way to recover data extensibility with visitors, even though it looks like it doesn't? Okay, so, you know, please find out. And uh, yeah, you might also want to relate it to, uh, to those aspects, of course, right? If you come up with a proposal, you should discuss in what sense uh, those requirements are met, okay? Now, next non-solution in C-sharp, partial classes. You know, partial classes are designed to allow you to scatter members of a given class over multiple code units. They are, however, designed and supported only insofar that those different code units have to be united uh, before actual compilation happens. So this is immediately clear that, you know, we can't satisfy the requirement of separate compilation in that manner. But let's look at the details. So what we can do with partial classes is 
we can actually start just from the pure data variance, right? So what you see here is just our lovely classes expre const and et. And you know, we just add those modifiers partial all over the place. By this we tell the compiler, hey, be careful. There might be other, you know, uh, slices for the same classes somewhere around in this compilation unit, okay? Uh, so this is very nice. So, you know, I mean, in, in terms of the code level modularization, this is, this is wonderful, right? So we can really start from the data variants and then in a separate code unit, we can add operations. So here we have a code unit, uh, you know, where we contribute the pretty print implementation to those classes. We don't repeat, of course, the data structural aspect of those classes, we only inject, uh, if you like, uh, the pretty print operation. So this is cool. And, you know, we can have just another slice, you know, another code unit to also now deliver the evaluator, right? So, I mean, it's very easy to uh, deliver operation by operation to those classes. The only thing is it's just an illusion. I mean, it's no, no separate compilation, no separate uh, type checking, nothing, right? It's just pre-processing. Uh, so it helps us with keeping our code like nicely organized, but it, it's not a full story, okay? And I should also emphasize that uh, the data extension story is not changed at all, right? So we can, of course, as before, just in basic old programming, we can perform data extension, that's easy. So, you know, because we can continue to have subclasses of expert. And uh, so, but you see, even in this case where we perform a simple data extension, something that was possible before without partial classes, we still add the partial modifier there so that we can perhaps extend also that class later on in case yet other operations, you know, emerge. Okay, so, you know, partial classes are wonderful from the code level organization point of view, but, you know, they fail ultimately because they don't support separate compilation. Next non-solution, uh, the use of type test and type cost. I mean, how would we do this? Well, we again would start from just those pure uh, data variants here, right? So only the data structural aspects are those on those classes, no methods. So we would actually, so this is a little bit like, you know, the function programming style where we have just an algebraic data type and, you know, nothing, not, no functions tied to it, right? So, and then we would go and define, um, you know, operations by means of static methods. You know, when I say static methods, you should think, ah, oh, this could be a function, you know, so it's a, it's a, it's a, poor man's approach of functional programming that we perhaps use a static method here. And indeed, if you, if you look at this code in a certain way, you can actually, you know, think of it as a recursive function definition that performs pattern matching. And, you know, how do you see this? Well, look at it. Okay, so it's a static method. It takes an expression, it returns an int, you know, just like our evaluated function in Haskell. And then it does a test here and a cost. So it checks, can I look at this guy as a const expression? You know, it's very much like pattern matching in functional programming. So if this works, you know, if this is a const expression, then, you know, deal with it, you know, evaluate it. So this is like the right-hand side of the equation in the Haskell program for constant expressions, right? If it's not a const expression, next attempt. Let's see whether this is an addition expression. If this works, again, we sort of obfuscate and encode, uh, you know, the right-hand side of the equation from the Haskell program, okay? And you see there is recursion here just as much as, this, as there is recursion in the Haskell program. So it's more or less the same style. It's just a little bit convoluted, right? And then there's the catch-all case here. I mean, uh, needed because of, uh, you know, C-sharp semantics, I mean, we have to have a catch-all case here because this is a uh, function that's supposed to return something. So yeah, well, if it's not constant, if it's not add, 
then, well, then we just throw an argument exception. So this is interesting. So, so we have seen that we can sort of uh, use visitors to simulate functional programming in C Sharp. And now we see that we can also use uh, type test cost to simulate functional programming in C Sharp. So we have a second style. So in a way, you know, in terms of code organization, this, this one here is even closer to the Haskell code. I mean, you know, you might have trouble seeing this because of all the obfuscation, but it's, it is conceptually very similar. It's just not at all statically type safe because, you know, in a way how we use costs here, you know, we can basically uh, forget um, cases, right? I mean, uh, the compiler wouldn't complain if we forget the case for add here. We even might easily end up trying types that are not feasible at all. Or if we later on go and make a data extension, like we add another subclass to expert, uh, this code would continue to compile. You know, this is very much different to the situation in Haskell, where all these scenarios that I just mentioned uh, are either infeasible or, uh, you know, um, uh, just uh, by basic language rules, or you know, there would be uh, type errors. So, so this is not very statically type safe. But um, you know, just for a second, let's try to understand whether this style perhaps can be tweaked in some way so that we also recover, uh, let's say, um, data extensibility. Because you should remember with the visitor-based style of pseudo-functional programming, uh, we could not, you know, preserve data extensibility. So, you know, and here, initially it also looks like we can't preserve it. Because, you know, how would we, how would we extend this function, this static method, so that, you know, it suddenly can deal with negation. Uh, it doesn't look like this is possible. So it looks like, again, we could sort of simulate function programming here and, you know, with the, you know, consequence that we get, like, operation extensibility, but we lose data extensibility. But there's actually a way to combine, you know, this kind of function programming fake with some OO expressiveness and it's actually a very small change that we need to apply. Namely, we need to switch from static methods to virtual methods. So now our operations are encoded as instance methods, right? And the idea is that because these are now instance methods, we can use object-oriented overriding to extend those operations, okay? So let's look at this for the case of pretty printing. So you see, we have a virtual method for pretty printing. Other than that, you know, we use the same style of type test and cost based case discrimination. So these are again, essentially the equations from the Haskell program for pretty printing. So this is like the pretty print function, you know, operation um, for those two you know, initial data variants. So how can we extend this uh, pretty print uh, method? Well, just ordinary OO style extension. So what we do, I admit it's a little bit complicated code, and I don't really suggest that you, you should use that style necessarily, but you know, it's sort of insightful, I hope, to understand this coding style, uh, you know, for the sake of our functional and OO programming interests. Okay, so what we do is when we do a data extension, so now we can do data extension, well, we first, of course, deliver the class, right? So here's the class, uh, neck, uh, you know, and it's another expression form. So, okay, and then we need to go over our existing operations, which are classes, and need to extend those classes so that we take care of the new expression form, right? Okay, so you see, we have a new class, pretty printer with negation uh, as a subclass of the previous pretty printer class. And then we override the pretty print method. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we basically, the first thing we do in this method is we delegate to 
the old pretty print method, right? So we, we, we try to invoke the base pretty print method. If this goes through without exception, we are fine. Obviously, in this case, the, the specific expression form at hand has been taken care of by the old uh, implementation. However, if for some reason, you know, uh, we exercise an expression form, you know, that's new, like negation, uh, then we will encounter this exception, which we catch here. And so we actually check, hey, is it this uh, new expression form that we are supposed to cover here? And if so, well, then we, uh, you know, uh, perform pretty printing for it. So this is, in a sense, again, an equation of a, you know, assumed functional implementation for a pretty printer. So, and then again, if negation is not at hand, then we might, again, uh, need to throw an argument exception. So you see how we can actually perform a data extension. And so, you know, the, the, the tricky thing is really, when you do a data extension, it's, it's more than just adding another data variant. It also involves updating, uh, you know, existing operations. And because we have model operations here as instance methods, we can perform this updating through object-oriented inheritance and overriding. And so it works. But of course, I should make clear, it's a non-solution anyhow, because it involves so much type test and type cost. And, and, and it you know, provides so little static type safety that you know, we don't like it uh, as a solution here. And then, you know, another non-solution that I want to quickly mention is, uh, is extension methods. So, you know, extension methods as part of C-sharp 3 um, actually allow you to add methods to existing classes after the fact without touching those uh, existing classes, without even recompiling those existing classes. So it really seems to go beyond partial classes, which are compile time only. Well, let's look at this. So, okay, so we would again start from uh, classes for, for those expression forms that do not involve any methods, right? As you see. So then we would try to, uh, you know, describe extension methods for those uh, data variants as follows. So you see how this works in C Sharp, right? So you, you just uh, start with some static class, which serves as the host for these extension methods. And then you define essentially static methods with some bit of special syntax here. So you basically designate the first argument of that method to be sort of the receiver type. So it's, it's a kind of, a, a, you know, semantically it's actually a static method, but, you know, you can use instance method uh, invocation syntax. Okay, so you have a extension method for the receiver type const and you have a extension method for the receiver type at and now this should be fine, right? Uh, well, until you think about or type check, you know, the body of the uh, extension method for addition. Uh, that body involves recursive function application. So, you know, in order to, for example, pretty print an addition, you also need to pretty print the sub-expressions. However, those sub-expressions can be any kind of expression. So, uh, you know, in order to deal with that uh, polymorphism, we, we would need, you know, a virtual method. But these are, this is not a virtual method. We don't have anything like an abstract extension method for expert, right? Of course, we could define a concrete ex ex uh, extension method for expert, but how would we implement it? Well, we would need to implement it through dispatch, so we would be again using you know type case and type uh, yeah, type switch. So you know uh, extension methods uh, are not expressive enough here because they don't support virtual methods. Okay, so that's it. So these are all the non-solutions that I wanted to discuss. And here's a summary of the expression problem. So how are we supposed to design a program so that we can achieve both data extensibility and operation extensibility? What language concepts help us to achieve those dimensions of extensibility? While, of course, preserving separate compilation and static type safety. So this is the expression problem. And 
what I want to do next time is to actually solve this problem in Haskell using, you know, Haskell's type classes. Okay? So, you know, you have discussed a little bit uh, those type classes here in this book. You know, there, there's actually this chapter, how it's called, uh, you know, chapter 10, declaring types and classes. And, um, right, so we will basically dive deeper into type classes and you will see that it's quite amazing that it can solve the problem. Okay, and if you want to do some bits of reading on the subject, here are some pointers. So, you know, the first pointer is um, an email, interestingly, by Phil Wadler, uh, where he, you know, an email to a mailing list where he actually gives the name to the problem and also gives a crisp, uh, you know, description of it. it you know, it's, it's not like, you know, this is uh, invented like back then, you know, um, it, it, this, this overall problem has been around for a long time, but you know, these days we, we call expression problem. And there are some pointers here to clever encodings or language extensions that try to solve the expression problem. So, you know, trust me, there are some crazy ways of coding in C sharp or Java so that you actually uh, you know, preserve separate compilation and static type safety. Um, and, but, you know, this is not straightforward. So, um, and I'm not sure that people are really using these encodings, but people like to use some language extensions, you know, if they are available, uh, like for example, those people who use aspect J, there is some language extension there for open classes, um, that solves the expression problem effectively. And yes, so the interesting thing is that, you know, Haskell uh, has some uh, bits in it that solve the problem. And, you know, it has it in there for many years. So it has not been specifically added to solve the problem. It was just sitting there to solve the problem. Okay, that's it. Um, thank you for your attention. And I look forward to uh, any questions and comments. And also look forward to uh, the next presentation on the Haskell-based solution of the expression problem. Thanks.